Hey there, everybody. Good morning. Colonial, this is your Facebook Live and YouTube Daily Devotional with Pastor Mark. And I just ran up the stairs because uh, I saw what time it was and one of my kids was trying to vie for my attention. So I uh, had to, to put him back downstairs <clears throat> and turn on Umi Zumi, which is one of his favorite shows. So I can have some uh, quiet time up here. Dan, Melanie, Rosie, good to see you today. It's raining outside. I was thinking about going outside for this devotional, but then turns out uh, outside my house, it just started raining not too long ago. So can't do that for today, uh, but good to be with you all. And Cheryl, good morning. Thanks for commenting. Always appreciate when everyone comments and posts. And also if you would like, you know, you have my permission to share this uh, as you are led. So all that being said, I'm going to wait a couple more seconds for a few more people to come on. My good friend and coworker Jeannie is watching. I don't know if Jeannie's in the office watching or if she's uh, at her house right now. Sandy, good to see you today. Thanks for commenting. Appreciate you being here. And uh, I want to share some personal a personal update to start off today. I just found out this morning that I'm going to start uh, have my port put in tomorrow and then start chemotherapy this Friday. So I'm actually excited and anxious to get that going. Uh, it's been a test of my patience, trying to stay patient with that. Uh, Charlene, good to see you. Harry, good day. I love it how Harry always says good day. Uh, greetings, Bob and Chris. Um, Bob, I think that we may have gotten a an ice cream cake from you. Uh, we appreciate Bob's gift to our staff about a week or two ago uh, that he ordered from Tulsa and thankfully it wasn't shipped from Tulsa or else it would have melted but uh, good morning Bernie good to see you I was just sharing a personal update that I'm going to start my chemotherapy treatment this Friday appreciate your prayers for that I'm going to go in for five hours and don't know exactly what to expect, but I'm going to meet with them on Thursday, the day before I go in and have an educational meeting and figure out exactly what that entails. Uh, I do know that my wife will not be able to join me and I'm going to be up there for five hours um, doing chemotherapy and then I'll be able to come home and, and do that. Jerry, great to see you as well. Thanks for tuning in today. Appreciate the prayers. And today, I uh, actually, I recently had this guy text me and say that he wanted to meet with me. And so I texted him back and I said, I'd love to meet with you, but but first I'd love to hear what's on your heart and what's on your mind, what some of the things that you'd like to meet about. And he said that he grew up in a fundamentalist environment and uh, the topic that he'd like to discuss is under trying to understand more about God's grace. Uh, he said he couldn't fully understand it because he grew up in a household and in a church environment that was that lacked God's grace. And so all that being said, um, I'm planning on meeting with him. But at the same time, I got this text from my aunt who texted me the verse John 1 16. And it says this, it says far, far, sorry, it says for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace for from his fullness speaking of Christ we have all received grace upon grace the verse continues in John chapter 1 verse 17 it says this for the law was given through Moses uh, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ so this topic of grace kept coming up over and over again and so I wanted to address it here today. Grace is, of course, as you know, one of the most essential parts of our theology, and also it's one of the most essential parts of our Christology, which is a study of Christ. But it's hard to explain, isn't it? Uh, a lot of us kind of know a little bit about grace, or we know what grace isn't. But it's one of those things that even if we have it up here, even if we've heard it taught in Sunday schools or, or in our church, until it's really gone from our head to our heart, it's hard to explain. We first need to experience it. And so my question for you today is to think of a time when God's grace became real to you. When was a time in your life when God's grace overwhelmed you? 
For me, one of those times uh, was when I was a youth leader at Colonial. And this was 10 or 11 years ago, but I had spent many hours and many weeks and many, many months investing in a group of guys at Center High School. And these guys, these guys were fatherless guys. These guys were unchurched guys. These guys didn't know much about God, uh, but they enjoyed the social aspect of church and youth group. And they were sort of ringleaders within their peer group at school. So I spent a lot of time with these guys. I spent a lot of time investing in them, driving them to church, uh, meeting up with them, going to their games. And then one Sunday afternoon, I invited them to a church function. It was a potluck that we had at our South Kansas City location in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, I, you know, as potlucks go, I don't remember any of the food that was brought. I, I'm assuming there was some fried chicken. I'm assuming that there was some pizza. I'm assuming that there were some company potatoes, uh, some casseroles, and things like that. But I do remember, I don't remember exactly what was brought, but I do remember there was this big bowl of cherries that some older lady in our church brought to the potluck. And for whatever reason, um, the guys that I brought, these are freshmen in high school at the time, you know, they, they thought it would be fun or funny to start taking those cherries and launching them across the table at one another. And then they thought it'd be even funnier if they would take the cherries and start launching them across the room and started to hit poor people in our congregation during their lunch and their fellowship together. And so I, you know, being the person that brought them, being their youth leader, I got pretty irritated with them. And I, I, I went over and I scolded them and I took them home and I decided after I dropped them off, that I am done with these guys. I had had it. Uh, later on that day, I remember going over to my in-law's house and I was mowing my in-law's yard. And as I was mowing, I just remember getting angrier and angrier the longer I mowed. I was fuming and, and just trying to, to um, shake my internal fist at God, saying things like, these kids don't deserve me. I'm done. And in that moment, I remember a very specific moment when the Holy Spirit came upon me and convicted me. And the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart. And he said this, he said, Mark, you were once a cherry thrower too. And it's a good thing that I didn't give up on you. Wow. Wow, I like stopped in my tracks. And what I learned in that moment changed my life. It changed certainly the trajectory of my ministry. You see, before that series of events some 10 or 11 years ago, I made ministry primarily about me. I was mostly interested in creating positive volunteer experiences or positive ministry experiences for myself. Ministering was something I liked to do because it made me feel good. But for me, ministry was conditional. I don't know if any of you have had that similar experience. I was happy to serve if you were grateful or if you recognized the effort that I was putting into it or if you appreciated me for doing that. But I hadn't truly grasped at that point in my life the depth of God's grace in my own life. That was one time when I experienced God's grace on a new level. It became real to me and it changed me. I wonder what your story is. I wonder if you have a similar type of experience. When did God's grace become real to you? Grace is the most essential part of the Christian faith, and yet uh, it's hard to explain. It needs to be experienced in some sense. It was the primary impetus, as you know, that led to the Reformation. And, and when we were reminded that salvation is made possible by grace alone, Sola gratia is the word, the Latin word. Grace is essential, yet it's difficult to define. Philip Yancey, who uh, wrote this book, I don't know if you can see this book, it's called What's So Amazing About Grace? And in chapter three, he talks about a world without grace, uh, or rather what he refers to as a world full of ungrace. And that is a world filled with stifling social pressures and guilt, or, and, and, and not just that, but uh, caste systems, and performance, and criticism, 
that leads to pride, it leads to comparison, it leads to disappointment, it leads to guilt, it leads to legalism and depression and loneliness. The world of ungrace leads to rejection and ultimately it leads to, to despair. The world full of ungrace is hell on earth. And yet, in many ways, it describes the culture in which we live void of God's grace. Yancey, he goes on to describe, he, he defines grace as unmerited or undeserved favor. Grace is unmerited or undeserved favor. And he says, this grace is offered in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He says that in Christ, there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any more. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. God loves you unconditionally. No matter what you do or fail to do, regardless of the types of sin or the amount of sins, he loves you because you belong to him. You are his child. Do you believe that? Do you live by that? Another helpful book uh, that I read back in college or just after college was this book, Ragamuffin Gospel. I'm not sure if you've read this book. It's by Brennan Manning. And in the book, he has uh, this quote. He says, the forgiveness of God is gratuitous liberation of guilt. The forgiveness of God is gratuitous liberation of guilt. He says, quote, the gospel grace announces that forgiveness precedes repentance. The sinner is accepted before he or she, or she pleads for mercy. It is already granted. He or she need only to receive it. Total amnesty, gratuitous pardon. Wow. Just take some time and to reflect on that. That's pretty amazing to think about, uh, isn't it? Matt Chandler is a pastor down in Texas, a pretty famous pastor. And sometimes I'll watch some of his YouTube videos. And uh, he has this one that came out probably seven or eight years ago that we often refer to on youth staff when I was on youth staff at Colonial. And he's uh, heard a sermon by a fundamentalist preacher about purity. Uh, and this fundamentalist preacher, he had this rose and he actually took the rose and he let everyone in the audience, you know, handle the rose. And by the time that they were all done, you know, the rose was disheveled and some petals were falling off and it was kind of bent over. And then the fundamentalist preacher got back up and he said, see this rose, this is like what it's like, you know, if you have sex before marriage and who would want this rose, who would want this rose? And Matt Chandler, who was in the audience at the time, he, it took everything in him not to shout out in that moment, Jesus wants the rose. That's the point of the gospel. Uh, that's not to say that there's no consequences for our sin or our actions, but it is to say that those consequences aren't a result of God loving us any less. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, Romans 5, 8 is a very famous verse. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It goes on to say in verse 9 and 10 and 11, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this, but also we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Praise God and amen. There is nothing that you can do that can make God love you anymore. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. God loves the famous athlete just like he loves the homeless beggar. He loves the porn addict as much as he loves the Bible study fellowship leader. He loves the white police chief as much as he loves the Black Lives Matters president. God loves you unconditionally and he wants you to love him back by receiving him and receiving his grace, receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Have you received God's grace or are you contributing to the pressures of ungrace? 
John 1, 16. I started with this verse. I'm going to close with the verse. It says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Give yourself permission right now, today, to receive God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor and allow your hearts to be impacted for eternity. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and for this lesson on your grace. God, I need more of it. We all need more of it. God, we thank you that the grace that we receive has already been offered to us in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we deserved that death that Jesus received, and yet he lovingly took that curse upon his shoulders so that we could receive eternal life. God, help us to live into that grace and to demonstrate grace to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me today, guys. Uh, So glad that you are here and can't wait to hear from Pastor Tammy tomorrow at 10 o'clock. God bless you.